y'all are kind. It's, it's great to look out and see all of you. And I'm blessed. I'm blessed to be part of an incredible church, an incredible family. And as, uh, as we're singing the worship songs this morning, just talking about God's love and how he takes us and how he accepts us and how uh, he will come into a heart when we open our heart and say, Jesus, come in to every part and heal every part. I want more of you. And what happens is there is a transformation that takes place in a person's life when they fully open their hearts and lives to Jesus. I'm saying Jesus can, can come into your life and completely and radically change you for, for incredible things. All for good. How many of you have experienced a, a, a transformation in your life? You are today somebody who you used to not be because of Jesus. If you just raise your hand and say, that's me. Look at this. We've got a room full of people who've been transformed. That's not to say we're all where we want to be or need to be, but we're going to talk today about real faith. We're in this series in James, James chapter 2, if you turn there. But before we do that, I want to sing a hymn. If you'll join me, it's hymn number 195. If you've got a book in front of you, you might have to share with somebody. I don't know if we have the words on the screens, but this hymn is Trust and Obey, and it goes so well uh, with my message this morning. So would you join me as we sing uh, this hymn? I'll do my best to lead. When we walk with the Lord in the light of His Word, what a glory on our way while we do his good will he abides with us still and with all who will trust and obey let's sing verse 3 not a burden we bear not a burden we bear not a sorrow we share but our toil he doth richly Not a grief or a loss, not a frown or a cross, but is blessed if we trust and obey. Trust and obey. But we never can prove the delights of his love until all on the altar we lay. For the favor he shows, for the joy he bestows, are for them who will trust and obey. Verse 5, then in fellowship while we sit at his feet or we'll walk by his side in the way what he says we will do where he sends we will go never fear only trust and obey trust and obey there's no other way trust and obey We can trust Jesus because he's a trustworthy God. He knows things that we don't know. He sees things that we can't see. He's everywhere. And he's promised to never leave us. He's always with us. And there is no reason that we have to doubt or to fear or to worry a God who loves us as much as he does and has a plan for our lives and is faithful to, to help us to live that plan out. We have a God who loves us more than we can imagine. Today as we talk about faith, talking about real faith, James gets into being pretty blunt here, which he's pretty blunt uh, from, the, from, the, from the beginning of the, of the book. But he's just got a blunt way of saying that, you know, what is faith? What is real faith? What good is it if you have a faith 
and multiple different things that he talks about. But we're talking about real faith, and we live in a world that's full of imitations and counterfeits. So much so that when you go to a grocery store, we have the labels on the products that we buy have things like this, 100% natural or real or authentic or genuine or pure. Why do we have to use those words to describe the things that we buy? Because there's a lot of imitation. There's a lot of counterfeit things. But here's the problem is that when we go to the grocery store and we're buying something that's all natural, do you know that you can buy all natural peanut butter that's not really all natural? You know that there is a tobacco company in the U.S., not that I know, I just read it, but there is a tobacco company here in in the U.S. uh, that makes uh, a cigar called a genuine counterfeit Cuban cigar. Made in Nicaragua. <laughs> At least they're calling it a genuine, a, a genuine counterfeit. We want something that's real. And if we go to buy something or we're going to invest in something and we find out later that it's a fraud, it's a fake, it's, it's a, a counterfeit, that disappoints us. We live in a world where there's a lot of things that aren't as, as, they, as they appear to be. They, they appear to be something that they're not. But when we talk about things that are real and things that are genuine, here's what, we, here's what we're saying. We want the real thing. When it comes to faith, do you want a faith that's real? Or do you want something that's counterfeit? We want the real deal. And this morning as we talk, uh, uh, talk about James chapter 2, talking about real faith, genuine faith. I want you to follow along as we read James chapter 2, starting with verse 14. And he starts out with these words, what good is it? What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith. I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there is one God. Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. You foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together. And his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. In the same way was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. James very bluntly here tells us that faith alone cannot save us. And you're saying, wait a minute. Aren't there other places in the New Testament? Doesn't Paul, the Apostle Paul, tell us that uh, we're saved by grace through faith and not by works? Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. It's by grace that we're saved through faith. This, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Paul also tells us in Galatians chapter two, verse 16, yet we know that a a person is made right with God by faith in Jesus Christ, not by obeying the law. And we have believed in Christ Jesus so that we might be made right with God because of our faith in Christ, not because we have obeyed the law. For no one will ever be made right with God by obeying the law. Some versions say by good works. 
So what, what's happening here? Can Paul, who says we're saved by faith, and James, who says faith alone isn't enough, you have to have works, can they both be right? You all are just staring at me. Okay, I'm going to give you the answer. And it's not the politically correct answer. It's the truth. Yes, they both, they both can be right. Yes, they both are right. And, and yes, because we're talking about two different things. You see, Paul and who he's talking about, he's addressing the issue of legalism. Those who would say, I have to keep all the Jewish laws in order to be saved. They would hold to, a person isn't saved unless they're circumcised. And if you, uh, if, you, if you fail in any one part of the law, then you failed in the whole thing. So it's about keeping the law. That's legalism. James is addressing a laxity issue. Those who say, it doesn't even matter what you do. You can do whatever you want to do as long as you believe in Jesus. Okay? They're both dealing with two very different things. Both use this idea of deeds and works but in two different ways. Paul is saying, uh, like I said, you don't have to be circumcised to be saved. James is saying, once you are saved, you need to live godly. You need to demonstrate your faith. It needs to be a demonstration. So Paul is talking about the root of salvation, okay, where it takes plant and grows uh, in your life, what happens on the inside of me. James is talking about the fruit, what comes out on the outside. Paul is talking about how to know that you're saved. And James is addressing how to show that you're saved. Paul's talking about uh, faith alone, which is how we become a child of God. And James is talking about faith plus works, how to, how to behave like a child of God. Okay, does that make sense? Okay? So they seem contradictory, but they're totally complementary. We know that we are saved by faith, by grace. It's by grace. Look at this verse in, in Ephesians chapter 2, 8 to 10. I think this is going to be on the screen for you. It's by grace that you have been saved through faith. Okay? Simple, plain, nothing else. This not from yourselves. It's a gift of God. It's a gift. For something to be a gift, it has to be given to you, Right? If someone were to give you, we're coming up on Christmas time, if someone were to give you a gift, they were just a, someone showed up here at church and they got a nice big wrapped present for you. You open it up and, 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 and here's, what the, here's what your response is. How much do I owe you for that? 50 bucks? You'd say, no, it's a gift. If I paid for it, it wouldn't be a gift, right? Salvation is a gift by God, not by works, Paul says, so that no one can boast. It's nothing that you can do for yourselves. He goes on to say in verse 10, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So we are saved by grace, through faith, not by works, but to do good works. Very complimentary to what James is talking about. I love how the New Living Translation says, and it says it like this, God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It's a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things that we have done. So none of us can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the good things that he planned for us long ago. I think it was Martin Luther that said, um, uh, help me out with this, Pastor. We, we're saved by faith alone. But f- but faith that saves is never alone. I think it's Martin Luther that's credited with that, with that saying. It's only, it's only faith that saves us. It's God's grace, our faith in him, that's it. But a faith that saves is never alone. It's always accompanied by work. So we're gonna look at this. What does James say? James chapter two gives us some, some important facts about faith to know that we have the real thing. Some, some vital things to know if our faith is alive and real. And he tells us some things that faith isn't. The first thing he says in in chapter two, verse 14, he says, what good is it if you say you have faith? What good is it if you say that you have faith but you don't show it by your actions? So we find that real faith isn't just something that you say. 
This person says they have faith. They claim to be a person of faith. They talk about things of faith. They know all the right things to say. But is it demonstrated in their life? James asked a rhetorical question. Can that kind of faith save him? See, we tend to label people who speak Christian-sounded language. Like you've got the athlete that gets up on the, on the podium or in front of the camera after a game, and what do they say? I just want to, first of all, I just want to give thanks and, and honor to my Lord Jesus Christ. Great. What good is that? And you go, wow, that's pretty harsh. But here's the deal. Do we just say because someone acknowledges Jesus, can we say that person's obviously a Christian? Are we Christian because of the things that we say? James says no. What good is it if you say you have faith, but there's nothing to back it up? Pew Research poll from 2014 shows that the the number of Christians in the United States is declining. So they did a poll in 2014 and found that 70 70.6, 0.6, 70 point, let me look at my, since I'm doing statistics, 70.6 of our population call themselves Christian. Seven years earlier in 2007, they did the same poll and it said that 78.4%. So over a seven year period from 2007 to 2014, a decline of nearly 8% of our population that claim to be Christian. Non-Christian faiths, like Jewish, Muslim, Hindu have grown about 1%. Those who are unaffiliated, agnostics, atheists, those who claim no religion at all, grew nearly 7% in that, in that time period. So we've got nearly 70% of our population that claim to be Christian, but yet some of these same poll c- companies like Gallup or Pew Research, other statisticians report that 40%, 40% of the population of the United States actually attends church on the weekend. So 70% are claiming that they're Christian, only 40% actually go to church. Just going to church, does that make you a Christian? No. But what's the fruit? If we claim that we, we're a follower of Christ, if we claim to be Christian, why aren't we going to church? There, the actual statistics, uh, there's a, a group of the Evangelical Covenant Church uh, started a study back in the late 1980s. And they've studied over this period of time 200,000 churches in the United States out of 330,000. So they're polling, they're looking at 200,000 different churches across the country. And what they found over this period of time is that only 17.7% of the American population actually attend church on the weekend. So we've got 70% claiming to be Christian, 17.7% actually going to church. What we say doesn't matter. Not everyone who professes Christ possesses Christ. Saying that you have faith and identifying with Christianity doesn't mean that you have faith. Talk is cheap. Real faith is not just something that you talk about. It's not just something that you say. Real faith is something that you live. James says, real faith is not just something that you say. And it's not just something that you feel. A lot of people confuse emotions with faith. You may come to church here, and I hear this from other people, and we hear it kind of on a regular basis, people that, people that have been moved emotionally in the service. I, as I was listening to the choir song this morning, every time I hear that song, morning by morning, new mercies I see. Reminding of myself and being reminded of God's faithfulness. He's always been faithful. It moves me. I heard people all throughout the week talk about how awesome the service that we had last week as we honored and recognized our veterans and our police officers. How emotional. I don't know if you've ever been in a, a, a church service here or somewhere where you've been moved emotionally, where you've actually cried tears. Or you felt goosebumps. It happens to me on a regular basis. But here's what I want to say. Real faith isn't just what you feel. Just because you come to church and cry a tear or get some goosebumps or feel moved emotionally doesn't equal faith. Faith is more than just an emotional response. If it doesn't 
make a difference? Does it cause you to do something? Verse 15, James says, suppose you see a brother or sister who has no food or clothing and you say, goodbye, have a good day, stay warm and eat well. But then you don't give that person any food or clothing. What good does that do? There's a a Peanuts cartoon from several years ago. Charles Schultz wrote this cartoon based on this, this verse of scripture and it's Charlie Brown and Linus and they're all bundled up out in the snow. You can see that it's snowing and they look across and they see Snoopy sitting on, on the top of his doghouse. And uh, they're, they're moved a little bit. They, they see that uh, Snoopy is cold, he's hungry, and they're talking about how sad it is. And they talk about how they ought to do something about it. So they walk over to Snoopy and, and they say, be of good cheer, Snoopy. In the next frame you see them just walking away. What good does that do? There's situations where we may feel bad for someone, but if we do nothing, what good does it do? 1 John 3, 17 says, if someone has enough money to live well and sees a brother or sister in need but shows no compassion, how can God's love be in that person? Real faith gives. Real faith is generous. Real faith can be counted on in a time of crisis. It's more than feeling sorry for someone. It's doing something about it. And I understand you have to use discernment. Just because you see someone in need doesn't mean you just go throw money at them. What they really need more than money is Jesus. What they really need more than money is you. Reach out and be a friend and be kind. Real faith isn't just something that you say and it's not something that you feel. And James says, it's not just something that you think. Verse 17 says, so you, see, so you see, faith by itself isn't enough. Unless it produces good deeds, it's dead and useless. Verse 18, now someone may argue, some people have faith, others have good deeds. But I say, how can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds? I will show you my faith by my good deeds. Faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by action, is dead. It's worthless, it's lifeless, it's useless, it's not real. Faith can't just be a belief system that you adhere to. It's not just an intellectual exercise in your brain. Faith isn't simply just agreeing with a statement of facts. See, if I tell you that I've done a lot of studying on physical health, and I, I am convicted, I, you know, I know that physical health is so important and getting the right amount of exercise and, and eating healthy and, and, and all these things, I, you know, it's just, it's so important. It's a high priority in my life, it's so important, and everyone, I believe, should maintain a healthy lifestyle. But you know that I, I don't eat well. I eat junk, junk food. I don't get proper sleep. I don't even exercise. You never see me exercising. I don't, know, I don't go to a gym, I don't have any equipment, I don't walk, I don't do anything. And you look at me and you say, okay, you're so passionate about how we all ought to have health, but you don't even do this yourself. What do you think about me? I think you got, you're, something's messed up. <laughs> Something ain't right with you. And it's true. How many of you know people who, they, they think, they study, they do all these things, but if you say, okay, if I'm looking at, I'm not, I'm not a person's judge of their salvation, but we can look at a person's life and see the fruit. What you say and what you do ought to match up. If I'm on my soapbox talking about physical health, you better believe I should be doing something about that if, I'm going, if I want you to believe me. If I was in a gym and I was exercising and I was eating, and you notice that I'd lost 50 pounds, guess what? You're going, hey, tell me about physical health. I can see it on you. What are you doing? How are you doing it? You look great. Why is that? Because there's fruit. Right? Make sense? James says, show me, prove it. Faith without action is dead. 
When Jesus comes into a person's life, here's, here's what I know. Everybody knows it. It's not a secret that you hide. If Jesus really comes into a person's life, you're going to know it. Faith in Jesus changes you. There's proof. There's evidence. Faith isn't just something that you say. It's not something that you feel. It's not a thought press, thought process. It's not even something that you just believe. James says in verse 19, you say you have faith for you believe that there's one God. Good for you. Even the demons believe this and they tremble in terror. How foolish. Can't you see that faith without deeds is useless? Just because you believe that that there is a God doesn't make you godly. It doesn't even make you Christian. There's a lot of people who say they believe in God. They can quote Bible verses. They can talk theology. James says, you believe in God, good for you, which is translated big deal. Big deal you say you believe in God. Where's the proof? Where's the evidence? Where's the fruit? The word believe in the Greek means to trust in, to cling to, to rely on, to commit yourself completely to. That's what it means to believe. It's not just saying saying some things out of your head that just come out of your mouth. There's a lot more to it than head knowledge. It's a conviction that leads to action. A lot of people will tell you that they believe in Jesus, but you look at their life. Do they even attend church? Not that that makes you Christian. Are they giving? Are they giving of their time, of their resources? Are they, are they, are they uh, following the Bible, the teachings, and putting them into practice? And if the answer is no, James is saying, you're a counterfeit. You're phony. It's not real. Big deal. I want it to be a big deal. I want Jesus to be a big deal in my life. I want him to be a big deal in your life. Real faith is more than just saying that you believe. Real faith is something that you do. There's nothing wrong with all these things, talking about Jesus, thinking about Jesus. There's nothing wrong with those things, but if there's no action, if there's not doing behind it, then it's not real. John 14, 15, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. See, real faith put in action isn't just a comment, it's a commitment. Faith that's real has power. It results in changed lives. You can see it by how a person lives. James ends this passage with two examples. Show that faith is real, real faith is something that you do. He talks about Abraham and Rahab. Two people that uh, you wonder how did he pull out those two people? Because you got Abraham who is a Jewish man and you've got Rahab who is a Gentile woman. You've got Abraham who is a patriarch. Rahab who's a prostitute. You've got Abraham who is a somebody in the Bible, a major character in the Bible. You got Rahab who is a nobody. Very minor person in the Bible, although Jesus comes from the bloodline of Rahab, which is kind of interesting. But Jesus uses these two examples to illustrate that it doesn't matter who you are as long as you have the right thing. Really, the only thing that these two people had in common was their faith. And it wasn't just that they said they have faith, they put their faith on the line. You remember Abraham? God had promised him a son. 75 years old, he and Sarah, his wife, were barren. They didn't have any children. God had promised to make him a great nation. You can look at chapter 15 where Abraham goes to God and says, look, it's not going to happen. You promised this, but now it's going to be one of my servants that's going to inherit uh, my wealth and, and that's going to carry on my name because you've not given me a child. And, and God said, I haven't given up on you. It wasn't until 25 years later, if you do the math, he's now 100 years old, And Sarah, his wife, is 90 when they had their first child, Isaac. What a blessing. What amazing faith. 
We know that uh, God, uh, Abraham, it was, his faith in God was credited to him as righteousness because he believed God, okay? Before this event that, that, that uh, James is referring to, because what he's referring to is about 11 or 12 years later, after Isaac had grown to be a young, a young man, he said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take your son, your only son, the son I gave you, the son whom you love with all of your life, and I want you to take him on a journey, and I want you to take him to Mount Moriah, and there I want you to sacrifice him to me. This is amazing faith because it said, the very, very next verse it says, the next morning, early the next morning, he arose and he got things together and they took off on their journey. Three days it took him to get where God told him to go. I don't have any idea what's going on in this man's mind. When God told him to sacrifice his son, and now he's going on a three-day journey, but he goes all the way through, they get to the place and they go up to the mountain he binds Isaac, puts him on the altar. He's getting ready to cut his throat. When the angel says, stop, God says, Abraham, now I know. I know that you fear me, and I know that you obey me because you haven't withheld your son, your only son, the son that you love from me. And God provided another way. Well, what a demonstration of faith. Rahab, the prostitute, the spies went into the country, they went to Jericho where she lived and she gave them refuge. They, she hid them. And uh, she said, here's the deal. If you, if you will spare me and my family, I'll give you a place to, to stay and I'll make sure that you get out, get out safe. Well, God worked an incredible thing. Here's a woman who didn't have a lot of faith, but she believed in the God of these, of these men. And she's listed in Hebrews chapter 11 as a great person of faith from two different backgrounds, two totally different people, but great examples of faith. God was testing them to see what kind of action and their works proved their faith. You see, faith isn't determined by what we do. Our faith is demonstrated by what we do. It's not about works. We're not saved by works, but a faith that saves is gonna have works right alongside of it. Our behavior, our actions show what we really believe and that we put God first in our life. And James is saying that when you have a relationship with Jesus, you're naturally going to express it. Your works are the natural product of the faith that's in your heart. Martin Luther said, good works don't make a person good, but a good person does good works. Billy Graham once said, there's really no conflict between faith and works. In a Christian life, they go together, like inhaling and exhaling. Faith is taking the gospel in, and works is letting the gospel out. And I think that's an amazing analogy. So let me ask you this question. Do you have that kind of faith? I want you to take a minute and, and examine yourself. Check your faith. Do you have a faith that's real? Do you have a faith that's a living faith that expresses itself in an outward manner? where there's fruit, there's evidence that people could look at you and say, definitely without a shadow of a doubt, I see the love of God, it's demonstrated who they are, how they live, how they act, how they love, all of those things. Jesus said, you'll, they'll know that you're, my, you're my, my disciples because you love one another. There's evidence. Paul said this to check our faith, 2 Corinthians 13, 5. He says, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Examine your hearts to see if you're in the faith, to see if your faith is genuine. Test yourselves. Do you, do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. So I ask you this morning, examine yourselves. Is your faith real? Is your faith real? Would you bow your heads with me? Do you have the kind of faith that James is talking about? I know that it's not by what we see what's going on necessarily in a person's life, but I look out and I see the room that's full of people. And Sunday after Sunday in this 1030 service, we, we, pack, we pack people in here.
But here's the reality. Tonight, there'll be a scattering of people here compared. We have two services in the morning, one at night. And on Wednesday night, for all of our adult classes, even less people than that. And I'm not saying your being at church on Sunday night makes you any more of a Christian. I'm not saying that at all. But I'm saying, that let's examine ourselves. Are we just a Sunday morning church attender? Is faith just something that we talk about? Is it just a feeling that we have? Is it just a belief system that we've subscribed to? Or is your faith really part of who you are? And it's like it's, you are a changed person. Examine if there's not a change taking place in you. If you're stale and stagnant, examine your hearts. And be honest and be real with God. The kind of faith that James is talking about is a real faith that has evidence. Evidence that Christ lives in you. I want to ask you this question. If your life is on trial for being a Christian, is there enough evidence to convict you? Not ta- talking about what you say, about what you feel or what, what you think or what, what you believe. I'm saying, is there evidence? In a court of law, they look for evidence. Is there evidence? Open your heart to Jesus. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I just want to ask you this morning, would you commit your life to him and follow him? And if you haven't done that, I want to invite you today to give your life to Jesus. You were created for him, by him, and he has a great plan for your life. Apart from him, you're lost. Apart from him, nothing makes sense. This morning, I want to say, if you are not in a relationship with Jesus, if you've not given your heart and life to him, this morning, would you do so? If that's you and you're here this morning saying, I need Jesus, I want to invite Jesus into my heart, would you just, with every head bowed and eye closed, just raise a hand saying, that's me. I want to give my life to Jesus this morning. I'm not just going through the motions. I'm not just, I really want Jesus. Thank you. Anyone else? This morning, I just want to talk to the rest of you. You've been saved. You know you're saved. You're saved by grace through faith in Jesus. But you're really examining your life going, there's not a lot of fruit. You know, I could be blamed for being anything or anybody. I want the evidence in my life to prove of who I am and who's in my life. This morning, if you're looking and you're examining your heart and saying, there's not, there's not the fruit that needs to be there. I've invited Jesus into my life, but I really, really want to experience what real faith is, that I can trust Jesus with everything. And that it does come out in the words I say, but it's backed up by the actions. I want to live my faith every day where the rubber meets the road, where real life happens. I want you to look up and open your eyes for a minute and I want to ask I want to ask you to do this if that's you this morning I didn't ask any of the second group to raise a hand but if that's you this morning and you're saying my life really you know I'm, I'm, I'm not looking at other people and judging other people I'm just examining my own heart and if I'm honest I, there's not the fruit that I would really like to see or maybe there's been in a time in my life where where there has been fruit and I'm not I'm not there where I used to be you're just not satisfied right now where what's coming out of your life. And I'm asking you today to say, if you choose real faith, and you're saying, I, need, I want to open my life, I want to open my heart to Jesus, and I want to ask him to make a difference. I want to ask him to change me. With everybody looking, with every head up and every eye open. Because this is, this is where real faith happens. It's where you can do it in front of people, not in secret. And you'd say, you know what, there needs to be a change in my life. And you'd admit, by standing up and just across the room, I want to invite you to stand only if you're saying, there needs to be a change in my life. And I'm committing today to giving my life fully to Jesus, to allow him to fully, completely change me, to make my faith real. To where it's not just something I think in my head, it's not just words that I say, it's not just showing up for church on Sunday. 
but I want real faith. And you're committing to a life of, of, of true, genuine, real, 100% pure faith in Jesus Christ in front of everyone where everybody's looking. If you're the only one that stands, you're going to be standing and everybody's going to be looking at you. stand because somebody else is standing, but if you're honest before God and before the people that are sitting around you, you're saying, I want to change in my life. I'm not satisfied where I'm at. I'm not being judgmental, I'm just being honest and being real. God, I pray for every person in this room. Those that have are giving their life to you today, saying, I'm coming to you, Jesus, and I'm inviting you into my life to save me, to change me, Turn my life around. Have your way in me. For those that stand today saying there needs to be a difference in my life. I want that root of salvation to grow fruit in my life. And I want it to be obvious to a world around that Jesus Christ lives in me. That I'm not ashamed. I'm not afraid. I, I put my complete trust in Jesus, my Savior. That whatever he wants me to do, I'll do. Wherever he calls me to go, I'll go. I'll do what you want me to do. I'll say what you want me to say. I'll be who you want me to be. And I don't care who knows it. I'm just going to be a genuine follower of Jesus and allow him to live full in my life. I pray for each person in this room, God, would you have your way in their lives. In Jesus' name.